Okay, we're live now. Okay, I see the live stream. Sergeants, we begin your recordings. PC recording has started. Okay, cloud recording is up. Backup is rolling. Thank you, Sergeant Kowalski. You may begin the opening. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Aging. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Okay, thank you. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and welcome to today's hearing. The committee will conduct a hearing on home care and caregiver strategy in the city, as well as two resolution that I am sponsoring, resolution number 1783, in support of state legislation to create a long-term care task force and propose res resolution 1784 in support of state legislation to place limits on the maximum number of hours a home care aide may be required to work. Study shows that programs that support aging in place produce a host of benefits for older adults, including improving their health outcome, increasing their financial savings, and helping decrease memory loss as they age at home. Last month, this committee had a hearing on the city's community care plan which is a plan to support older adults aging in place and home care is an essential part of aging in place. New York City has an estimated 900,000 to 1.3 million unpaid caregivers, also known as informal caregivers or family caregivers who provide support for someone with whom they have a personal relationship. The pay home care workforce, which is primarily comprised of women and people of color, has doubled in size over the past 10 years and has shifted from institutional and hospital-based setting towards private homes and communities. While these services are needed now more than ever, unpaid caregivers are often not provided with the resources and programs that they need to provide services while still maintaining their mental and financial health. Home health aides work long hours with little pay. During this hearing, the committee seeks to uncover DIPTA's plan for caregivers, both pay and unpay, to ensure that quality services are provided while also protecting the caregivers who provide these services. In addition to this oversight topic, we will hear two resolutions. The first resolution, number 1783, support state 598B and the Senate version 3922A in the state legislation to create a task force to study the state of long-term care services in New York. The COVID-19 pandemic has, has hit long-term care service particularly hard in New York State. In addition to the devastating death in nursing homes, more than 2,700 home health aides had to quarantine due to possible exposure to COVID-19. More than 780 home health aides contracted COVID-19, and sadly, 33 home health aides died of COVID-19. Senate Bill 598B and Assembly Bill 3922A would create a task force to examine the state of long-term care and the limitation 
that negatively affect the quality of care of these services. And this task force would be charged with examining COVID-19 specific challenges and longstanding issues that made long-term care system vulnerable to outbreak during the pandemic. This legislation would help improve long-term care services provided to some of the most vulnerable residents across New York State and would serve as an initial step to protect them from future outbreaks. The second resolution we are hearing today is proposed resolution number 1784A, which support uh, the Assembly Bill 3145 and the Senate Bill 359 in the state legislature to place limits on the maximum number of hours a home care aide may be required to work. There is a substantial shortage of care workers in the state of New York. As 17% of home care positions are currently left, left unfilled, according to the City University of New York and the Association on Aging in New York. It is well known that long hours and little pay contribute to the shortage of home care positions. New York labor law as interpreted by the New York Department of Labor entitles care workers to eight hours of sleep and three hours for meals during a 24 hour shift. Under the 13 hour rule, and yet many workers have reported that they do not always receive these rights. Placing limits on the amount of hour a home care aide works, ensuring that they are paid for the amount of work that they are doing are critical and elemental to respecting the essential work of the home health aides and increasing this much needed workforce. Thank you to all the advocates and members of the public who are joining us today. And thank you to the commissioner and your staff and representative from the administration for joining us. And I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are also here today. We are joined by uh, Council Member Diaz Sr., uh, Council Member Brooks Power, and Council Member Vallone, and Council Member Rose. Thank you for joining us. I would also like to thank my staff, Connor Irvin, and Aging Committee staff, Crystal Pine, Aliyah Reynolds, and Daniel Krupp. Oh, Council Member Ayala has also joined us. So now I am going to uh, turn it over uh, to our moderator, our senior policy analyst, Crystal Pine, to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst to the Aging Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the Q&A portion of the admin testimony. I will be calling on public witnesses to testify after the conclusion of the administration's testimony and council member questions. So please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, Commissioner of the Department for the Aging. Associate Commissioner Jocelyn Grodin from DISA will be available for questioning. I will call on you shortly for the oath, then again when it is time for your testimony. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for submitting written testimony for the record is 72 hours after the hearing. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. To all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath and call on you um, each individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Uh, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. I do. Associate Commissioner Grodin. I do. 
Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin your testimony. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson Chin and to the members of the Aging Committee. Um, I am, as you, as you just heard, the Commissioner for the New York City Department for the Aging, and my name is Lorraine Cortez Vasquez. I'm joined today uh, by Jocelyn Grodin, the Associate Commissioner for Social Services and Direct Service. And I'm happy to discuss the topic of home care and caregiving strategy, because it is very timely that we're having this conversation in November, which is National Caregiver Month. Consistent with DIFTA's overarching goal of making New York City the model age inclusive city in the country, and to be recognized as such globally, we issued a five-year community care plan that was released earlier this year and which the councilwoman alluded to. This plan provides innovative roadmap for meeting the needs of the growing diversified older adult population. And as you know, this plan centers on supports that allow the older adult to safely age in place which includes home care, caregiving, and technology supports, as well as meals. We wanna focus on the home care and caregiving supports during this testimony. We appreciate the past advocacy of the, and support of the council that has allowed us to expand services and implement the first year of the community care plan. We look forward to your continued support to realize the future goals and investments required uh, to fulfill the five-year strategic plan. New York City has a large and diverse unpaid caregiver population, as well as the growing older population of, uh, of older adults. In accordance with Local Law 97 of 2016, DIFTA conducted a survey of unpaid informal family caregivers in order to create a comprehensive plan to address their needs. DIFTA developed and administered this survey in partnership with the Administration of Children's Services, the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, and their respective provider networks, the Mayor's Office of Operations and WESTAT, which was a social research team. Based on the survey and the study, DIFTA estimated, as the council member mentioned uh, and the chair mentioned earlier, that there were roughly 900,000 to 1.3 million New Yorkers, including those who care for older adults or someone with dementia, disabled adults, or provide kinship uh, care. Based on this study in 2018 and revised in 2021, DIFTA issued a plan to support uncare, uh, unpaid caregivers in New York City. The plan also ran several citywide month long multilingual caregiving support media campaigns to aid in the caregiver self identification, learning that personal care tasks performed, in fact, um, in fact, caregiving that is the help available to their community. As you know, most people don't even consider themselves caregivers because it is part of family responsibility or cultural norm. And that's why this caregiving campaign, media campaign was so essential. These campaign, this campaign ran in May, 2018, and it ran again in June, 2021. This campaign has opened many doors for caregivers so that they know the resources available to them. Since the start of the campaign, there have been over 2,800 calls to 311 regarding caregiver support, which put them in contact with the corresponding provider to address their needs. The caregiver strain index is the one means that we use to demonstrate. Uh, it measures the level of stress of a caregiver. And as a result of these campaigns and services, caregivers have shown an improvement of 15% in stress level. As a caregiver, I can tell you that the stress level is quite high for caregivers. And I'm one that has supports and it is still high. Through these programs, over 5,200 unduplicated caregivers were served in 2021. 
That includes 200, uh, 2,100 who received virtual and telephonic training, counseling, and group services. And that is an innovation and opportunity and a gift and a lesson learned that we got during COVID. DIFTA and our providers have also been conducting wellness calls throughout the pandemic to combat social isolation and share information and resources. As of November 1st, over 6 million wellness calls to clients have been conducted. Regular technical assistance is provided to the caregiver programs to ensure that the programs can pivot and meet the needs of the changing needs of the caregivers. And during the pandemic, DIFTA conducted weekly call-ins with program directors to offer support and encouragement as they pivoted to virtual services. Monthly meetings are also held with the providers as well as presentations by subject matter experts to increase uh, in, uh, awareness of caregiver related topics and resources available. At the height of the pandemic, program staff, staff were struggling to help caregivers cope with loss and grief. DIFTA responded by providing additional training so that more staff could lead support groups to meet these needs. And I, later on, I, I will, I hope you asked me about the virtual programming chairwoman Chin, so I can tell you some of the innovations that happened there. And uh, it's a new technique and tool that's available to us. The program also found innovative ways to conduct community, virtual community outreach, virtual respite care, and joint social engagement events to target social isolation among caregivers and their care uh, recipients. Um, one care program offered a virtual tour of the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens and virtual concerts. Another offered a, a sing-along a uh, sing-along play written by the program director, which the clients perform and delivered pies during the holidays. DIFTA worked closely with the programs to ensure that these innovations could be implemented while still adhering to program standards. Caregivers provide essential assistance to, uh, caregiver programs provide essential assistance to caregivers struggling with their caregiving tasks. For example, one program helped the caregiver purchase a needed refrigerator as it broke during an in-home stay order. Several programs ensured that food and essential services were delivered to the home of the care receiver, receivers when caregivers were unable to drop off the items themselves. Urgent needs also arise, such as the inability to, cost, to cover the cost of durable medical equipment, assistance devices, funeral expenses, or the need for emergency respite care. DIFTA promptly reviews these client files in order to prevent delays in the caregivers receiving these much needed support services. DIFTA also runs the Grandparent Resource Center, which has over 1,000 kinship caregiver clients and serves thousands of older adults and families across the five boroughs. And the Caregiver Resource Center provides a range of resources, including help in accessing benefits, training, advocacy, and case assistance. The program is currently operating, like everything else, on a hybrid mode model, providing virtual and on-site programming at 15 NYCHA public housing developments and the surrounding communities. And you know that providing in-home services is essential to allowing older adults to age in place. These, there are roughly 20,000 clients served through the DIFTA's case management programs. Currently, DIFTA works with 21 case management and five home care agencies across the five boroughs. Once referred for services, the case management agency conducts a phone assessment and coordinates us, uh, which services are best to serve the client. For those who are identified as homebound, a trained specialist will determine services to help those older adults remain safely in their homes. And some of these services may include home delivered meals, home care, housekeeping, and personal care, such as bathing and dressing. 
Additional services may also include in-home counseling and access to community resources, friendly visiting, pay, bay, uh, pay bill, uh, paying bills assistance, and all other supports. DIFTA currently has roughly 3,000 clients receiving in-home care. Shifts for staff providing these services are typically four hours long, five days a week. Given the current contracts, our program seems to be allowed, aligned, I'm sorry, with the intensive eight uh, 315A, for which a resolution is being heard today. Finally, I would not be remiss, I would be remiss if I didn't speak about all the efforts that the administration and DIFTA have done on the vaccine front. As you know, homebound individuals and older adults are the most, have been and continue to be the most vulnerable during this pandemic. Our continuing engagement with clients has included current information about COVID, vaccine access, such as assistance with scheduling appointments. Additionally, as in-home vaccinations became available and then expanded um, eligibility, our case management agencies and DIFTA staff have been engaged with all homebound individuals to notify them of this program and help them sign for in-home vaccine appointments as desired. I wanna remind all council members to re in, remind your constituents that in-home vaccination is available for all, um, for older adults and their family members and others. We continue to work with the Department of Health and uh, Mental Hygiene, as well as the Vaccine Command Center on uh, Vaccine Outreach and Access. 33 older adult centers operate as temporary vaccine hubs and 36 centers hosted the vaccine ban over the summer. Additionally, in partnership with the Vaccine Command Center, we established temporary vaccine distribution hubs at several NORCs and participated in collaborative initiatives to reach out to older adults in underserved communities to schedule vaccine appointments. According to the Vaccine Command Center, so far, 30,000 New Yorkers have had 46,000 administered at home and the at home uh, vaccination program. We're committed to doing our part to continue to raise awareness about this benefit and about services. And shortly you will see a public service of uh, campaign that DIFTA is engaging with to ensure that we can get that uh, those older adults that are not vaccinated. I believe the number is 20% of older adults are still not vaccinated. And the highest percentage of those are those who attend senior centers, which is a concern for us. I would also again like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss home care and caregiving in celebration of National Caregiver Month. I also wanna thank our providers for whom all of these fundamental services would not be possible if they were not engaged with the community every day. They provide these essential services to older New Yorkers in the language and culture, uh, and, cu and culture that is appropriate. And as always, I'm especially appreciative of the council's advocacy, support, and deep commitment to the Department for the Aging, but mostly to older New Yorkers and to increasing the resources and benefits available to them. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, we also have been joined by Council Member Traeger and Council Member Dinowitz. Okay, so I will, uh, Committee Council, should I pass it back to you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before I turn it back over to you, I'd just like to remind Council Members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that they have a question for this panel. Uh, please remember to keep questions and answers to five minutes. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. And I will turn it back over to you, Chair Chen. Thank you. I'm gonna start some questions and I really encourage my colleague, um, let me know if you have a question and then I will defer. Uh, for the unpaid caregiver, um, the unpaid care, there's a working group. The unpaid caregiver working group uh, suggested 
leveraging several existing touch points within city agency, not overtly associating with caregiver to disseminate such information or services such as um, the Department for Education, Health and Hospital. And in the progress report, DIFTA stated it developed ongoing relationship with hospital for information and referral purposes. Um, can you explain what does that entail? Sure. You know, as you said, and as some of the bills that you are encouraging, um, we are serving 5,200 caregivers. They are potentially 900,000 to 1.3 million. Mm -hmm. So you see the gap between the number, uh, and I'll just say that 25% of them don't even know that are caregivers, so let's exclude that because that's a different outreach approach. But we cannot narrow that gap and expand services <laughs> to that number unless we do that in partnership with other agencies and to also educate other agencies. So I'm gonna give you one example that we're doing with Bellevue Hospital and their social work staff, as well as discharge planners and their gerontological fellows and doctors and nurses. We have them, we present uh, them uh, services and then help them how to identify individuals and, and refer individuals to the appropriate services because they are usually the frontline person mm -hmm. who can identify if a family's in stress and caregiving, caregiving is needed. So one of our contracted uh, provider also is building on relationships with local hospitals to make them aware of their services. Prior to the pandemic, some of our providers held tabling events at hospitals to distribute program information. Usually discharge planners and the hospital social workers are a key partner. And so we have to keep uh, educating them. And then uh, Jocelyn, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you want to talk a little more about some of the other phenomenal partnerships that you've created over the course of the year. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Council, for this question. We're, we're always looking to spread the message um, in terms of who caregivers are that, um, and what it means to be a caregiver, as well as services and supports that are available to this population. So for example, um, one of the things we've recently been doing is working with DOHMH um, to look at training primary care physicians through their network of providers and distributing materials um, that uh, help uh, bring the message forth. We also work very closely with NYCHA, um, housing networks to continue to push this message and opportunities to access support and services. So um, in the 2020 progress report, uh, DIFTA stated that it trained agencies and contract staff uh, in the mayor's office for community mental health, formerly known as BRI NYC, uh, in mental health first aid training. Is this training uh, available to informal caregivers? Um, Jocelyn, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Yes. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. The intended audience for mental health first aid training are frontline workers and gatekeepers and not informal caregivers. So no, um, this training is not targeted to that population. Um, but they do offer trainings for mm -hmm. caregivers that target caregiver burnout uh, feelings of anger and guilt and trainings that teach the caregivers. So those frontline workers do provide trainings to the caregiver, not the mental health first aid training, but other trainings to teach them on coping strategies and improving their mental health and overall well-being. Okay, yeah, because that's really important. I mean, like being a caregiver, I mean, a lot of time they get very frustrated and, you know, we don't want any elder abuse you know, issue happening. And so I think that's that's important to make sure that they also get the support. Um, you know, the unpaid caregiver plan recommends continuing uh, to offer information, referral, counseling, support group, 
uh, wellness follow-up calls and virtual programming that you talked about uh, to reduce isolation among caregivers and offer them a connection. So can you please explain how DIFTA identifies individuals who are isolated? Um, in the letter that uh, to the council, uh, DIFTA stated that um, and their provider have placed, as you said, over 6 million wellness call um, to older adults since the start of the pandemic. So with the calls, how many individuals did DIFTA and providers actually re reach with this wellness call? And then what kind of services are offered uh, during these wellness calls? And, and do you also have data in terms of how many individuals accept the services through the wellness call? Uh, Justin, you wanna talk a little bit about what the wellness call entails, who provides it and how people can get access to it, including Agent Connect, thank you. Wellness calls are conducted throughout our network, which includes DIFTA direct staff. For example, the commissioner spoke earlier about our Kinship Caregiver Resource Center. So all of the staff that work directly there are conducting wellness calls as an example with their um, full network of clients. Um, also um, most relevant are providers. Um, and all throughout the DIFTA portfolio, whether it's older adult centers, caregiver services, case management, and so on and so on, um, are all making these wellness calls. As you said, we've made over 6 million wellness calls. The calls are rooted in looking at things like, do you need mental health support, safety issues, immediate concrete needs like accessing food, um, however, um, they're very client-centered and specific to the particular needs of the client. So the people making these calls have ongoing relationships with the clients and adapt the call based on the frequency that they want. So it could be twice a week or it could be every other week. Um, again, client-centered and um, really focus on the particular needs, referrals, supports of that client. So someone who... Um, for example, is feeling isolated or lonely, might be getting more routine supportive calls. And Chair Wilson, you... I'll get you information. We don't have it right now, but I of those 6 million, I will get you information on how many of those are caregivers immediately after this hearing, okay? Okay, and then I guess the, the issue also is that how many people were actually um, you know, connected. Uh, I mean, if it's the majority, that's fantastic. Um, right. We just want to choose, you know, kind of like know what the success rate is and making sure that, you know, people who are not connected, then how do we kind of reach reach them? Right. So we'll get back to you with that, but mm -hmm. I, I think an important um, thing thing to um, for context is that we have made efforts to reach out to every single one of our active clients. Um, mm -hmm. However, some clients are, are are doing really well, and and they don't want these calls, and and they have what they need through our services programs or their own supportive family and friend network. Um, so in some cases, the calls are one time. Um, and then um, for clients with different needs or interests, um, we adapt accordingly. So, so I do think that's an important consideration that not everybody wants to opt in. Yeah, I think with that though, is that we could just say like, well, how many, how many individuals that actually was reached? I mean, I don't think we reached 6 million, right? So, no, we have so not we, reached 6 yeah. million. They're not 6 <laughs> million. We've made 600 calls, but we will, we will get you what number that is or as close to that data as we can, right? Yeah, that would be good. You know, they all, also the unpaid caregiver survey stated that respite care was a major need that was not being fulfilled. Um, the caregiver program respite budget was doubled in 2018 with the addition of 4 million. So what is the current status of uh, this program's budget and have respite service been successful and how does DIFTA measure the success of this program? Uh, the respite care program is a high demand program. It's an expensive program and it is in great need. And I say it's one of the most successful. We are very pleased that we were able 
to double the mo the money from um, four million to eight million. Mm -hmm. um, yet that the need is so because uh, that includes a, a, maybe include a weekend away, may mm -hmm. include you know uh, transportation support. It's a it's a myriad of programs. But what we've done was to ensure that the funding allowed us to get two additional providers so that we can then expand more, more access to respite care. And so now we have about 12, giver, 12 caregiver programs throughout the city. And at least we also have uh, three citywide programs which are serving special need populations. Um, but respite care is, is high demand, high cost, well-deserved program. And, um, you know, and the, and the care and the respite care goes the, from uh, one hour of just entertaining the care recipient so that the respite care person can move away to a weekend if the person has had 24 hours, providing 24 hour care. Um, mm -hmm. for months. And so the, the, the services are very, very varied. And, yeah, and it's, uh, yes, Jocelyn. Um, uh, just to highlight, um, in addition to what the commissioner said, um, some of the specialized programs included in the expansion are LGBTQ, supporting clients with significant visual impairment and um, better reach into Asian communities in New York City. Um, in addition to the, the very important and critical respite services that, that the commissioner spoke about, it also included an expansion of our supplemental service dollars, which include money for transportation, for doctor's appointments, personal care items. So um, this increase has meant um, tr you know, a tremendous increase in support to older adults. And you asked um, about client outcomes. So one of the ways we measure it is to look at reductions in caregiver stress. Um, mm -hmm. And as the commissioner said in her testimony, we've seen significant reductions even during the pandemic, which I think is you know, pretty, pretty profound during this stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, that's why, you know, we want more people to know about this and then we have to continue to advocate for more services because unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about it. Um, a lot of caregivers, same thing with the, and I've talked about in the past, you know, same thing with the uh, home care program. And it's, it's such a, a blessing, you know, when people find out about it and they just like were just so thrilled that they could take a break. You know, somebody could take care of their family member and they can go get a haircut, you know, go to the bank, go to a swim class just to de-stress. So we just want to make sure more people know about uh, these services um, that are available. Which is um, why, uh, Council Member Chin, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. which is why it's been so important for these partnerships and outreach, you know, because even the primary care physician and the discharge planners, when they know that this is available, it's, that is also an opportunity. So that has been, that's an important uh, part of this also, you know, is getting more people to know so that they can mm -hmm. then have more people access it. Yeah, I mean, that's why definitely primary care doctors in the neighborhood, I mean, everyone should know. And then relating to that, it's also, you know, more public service announcement or, or outreach, you know, to ethnic media, community media, um, for people to hear all these success stories and, and then how to idea. be able to yeah. access it. I mean, that's, that's something that we just want everyone to know. Um, I mean, when you do your advertising, you know, on bus shelter or, or subway, I mean, that's good too. Uh, but then there's so much, you know, other um, means, and especially free media and, and ethnics and community media. Um, and I mean, just like a Chinese radio station that is like 24 hours and everybody listened to it, small businesses. So yep. you have stories. I mean, that that's really great. Um, yep. There is a, can you also tell us in terms of uh, the plan recommending maintaining a working group similar to the one um, that was created, that was reported uh, in 2021 plan. Um, updating a caregiver working group 
to continue to exist. So who, who is on this working group and how often do they meet? And what is the mission of this working group? Okay, Jocelyn, you can talk about that in the regular meetings we have with the providers and the working group. Thank you. I'm gonna go on mute because I have a friendly okay. neighbor here who needs to bark and I need to get him to okay. someplace else. <laughs> The, you the working, me? Okay. The working group is made up of directors of our contracted caregiver programs. The group continues to meet monthly to talk about um, things like we're talking about here, how to um, and continue to expand and improve upon service delivery, get the message out. Um, they discuss various programmatic issues, as well as trends and data that we're seeing throughout the city. And DIFTA provide, meets regularly with the providers to provide technical assistance. And then, of course, um, the program officers um, here at DIFTA are talking to programs regularly, again, looking at data, seeing um, how we could continue to um, commit to continuous quality improvement and um, solve client specific concerns or challenges um, and, and support the programs. So how many people are on there? How many? I, I, I would have to get back to you on that. So it's all the, the provider of the caregiving program. It's all of our providers, typically at the director level. Of mm -hmm. course, um, we engage at the executive director level also. And um, there's certainly opportunity at these meetings for directors at our provider agencies to bring in staff, you know, who mm -hmm. sometimes ha have a different lens and, and perspective. On the and, and how often do they meet again? They meet monthly. Monthly, okay. So they meet monthly and then um, at that more granular program level, um, the program officers are routinely engaging with um, all of the providers and um, provides um, a regular opportunity to, to reach out with any emerging issues, needs for technical assistance, case specific challenges. And the, the unpaid caregiver plan also include recommendation uh, to encourage um, New Yorkers to identify themselves as caregivers. And in response to this recommendation, uh, DIFTA reported continued outreach to caregivers uh, to encourage them to call 311 and ask for caregiving support. Uh, so how many people have called 311 and identified as caregivers? You have that data? Um. I don't have that piece of data right in front of me. I'll, I'll try to get it for you during this conversation. Um, you're right. Um, certainly, one of the things the survey most critically showed is that people providing regular caregiver support are um, often not identifying as mm -hmm. caregivers. Um, and, and to your earlier point, um, Chair, uh, we, we did do a campaign. We've done a few campaigns. The most recent one was in June, June. Uh, of this year um, and uh, focused very heavily on, on ethnic media and, and getting the message out to different groups and populations. And the number, uh, thank you, um, was over 2,800 calls to 311 as a mm -hmm. result of the campaign. Right, and then in addition to that chairwoman, in addition to the 311 calls, we also get a number of calls through the uh, Aging Connect number. Aging Connect. And, and, and okay, so so that supplements the 311 or augments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, ask some question about home care. So, according to the FY21 MMR, a total recipient of case management service and hours of case management service provided peaked in FY20 and then level off again in FY21. Uh, are those numbers on track to increase or decrease for the first half of FY22? And what is the current wait list for case management services? Uh, Jocelyn, do you wanna take the, um, do you wanna take this one? Um, 
I can tell you that service, the need for services did peak. And, but we've seen uh, it leveling off back to, uh, to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and so when you look at the MMR, you know, the period that the MMR is reporting, it was in the midst of pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so if we're looking back to, to, ninth, uh, to FY19 to get a more uh, correct uh, look at that. Um, and we see a slow returning to these numbers. Um, it's, you know, but during the pandemic, especially given the stay at home orders, there was a hesitancy uh, from older adults to receive in-home services also. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was there was a even though the demand was higher, you know, we saw the demand, but there was also a hesitancy to have someone in the home. Um, but I will, will but I will give you a sense of what those actual numbers are, because we're looking at that very closely. Also, a uh, chairwoman chin. So is there a current wait list uh, for case management and also uh, for home care services? There, you know, in terms of a, of a wait list, and we'll, you know, depends on how, yes, there is a wait list. And, uh, and, um, and there, and, and, and how we determine that wait list is, is very uh, interesting because there is a wait list for people who have not received any services. Mm -hmm. or who, for whom the full assessment hasn't been done. And then there's a wait list uh, for those clients, you know, who are waiting for that full assessment. And what we do during that period is every two months we go back to make sure that the, at least what we've assessed for is necessary. Um, and then we are also, and then we distinguish those on the wait list from those who need additional services. You know, some people think mm -hmm. of the wait list of everybody who's waiting, and we really try to distinguish those two. Uh, but of course, yes, there is a wait list um, for both home care and case assistance. And yeah, I think for, mm -hmm. I mean, for yeah. home care, I mean, that, as you say, there might be also wait lists for um, increased additional, hours. Additional, yeah, additional hours, hours, exactly. Hours, yeah. So that, you know, that'll make a wait list look higher, but it's not that they don't have a service, it's just that they want additional services. And the, the, the great thing about the, you know, the Diff to Home Care um, service program, a lot of people don't realize is that, because out in the community, especially in ethnic community, immigrant community, they just think about, oh, you get home care only if you have a Medicaid, right. uh, the white card. Oh, oh like you're really low, low income in order to qualify. And oftentimes people don't know that they can qualify for the DIFTA home care service, the ISEP program. And once they find out, they were just so thrilled that they're able to, you know, get whether it's 12 hours. Yeah, or more. yeah, and it's, it's, you know, I think it goes back to your earlier comments, which we're totally in agreement with and need to do more of is this public education around both caregiving, but also the non-Medicaid uh, home care. And as I say that, my stomach goes into knots because we also need to make sure that we can continue that and increase that in the years, you know, two, three, four, and five of the, of the strategic caregiving plan. So, you know, the, you, 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 you've heard me say this ad nauseum, you know, the, the demand always outpaces the resources. But in this one, if we're moving towards community care mm -hmm. and living at home, then that has to be an integral part of that conversation. That awareness also has to be an integral part of that conversation. Uh, just uh, one more thing on the a MMR. <laughs> the FY21 MMR shows that uh, the number of people receiving information and or supportive services through DIFTA's caregiving program has declined by 44% in the past two years from 11,399 on uh, fiscal year 19 to 6,368 in fiscal year 21. You know so what, what, yeah. what drove this decrease? Um, 
I, you know, I think, and Jocelyn, correct me if I'm wrong, or uh, Sarah, help me with some information. This was one of those situations where we we created um, Agent Connect during that same period. Mm -hmm. And, and it was some of the data was being captured in Aging Connect, which does not, Aging Connect data is not re, uh, reflected in the MMR. Or, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's an operational brouhaha that we need to figure out internally to how to keep, how to make the MMR reflect some of the data um, that, um, you know, Going, how do we keep the data and the the data going from the uh, aging connects and the three one one and incorporating those into the MMR? Currently, it only reflects the three one one and not the. Am I confusing you? Um, it only, it's only one data source and not not mm -hmm. compiling the data of the information that we're getting in the in aging connect, and we need to figure that out internally with uh, with city ops and the MMR people? I mean, the main thing is that we don't want that to affect the caregiver contract. Right. Whether it's right. a payment to the provider or you decrease your numbers or we're gonna yeah. have to decrease your, your funding. We, right. we don't want that we to have, We have the data, we have the data, but it's not because this other system was created, it's not incorporated in it, but you're absolutely right. Now that you said it might be a funding question, I will make sure that that gets corrected. We just don't want those caregiver <laughs> programs to get less money because yeah. of yeah, the, the mix up in the data. Um, is there a plan to screen those in the 60 plus recovering meal service program for home care services? Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, um, we, um, right now, we've identified, of those you know, we're still waiting for complete data from Get Food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we thought we, we started a census on for November 1st on Get Food. And then we've gotten 700 uh, new clients that they've identified. And now we're saying that they're saying there's another one, another 700 possibly. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're working with the data that we have. But with the data that we do have, as you know, or as I, let me recall, let me remind you what we did with them. We parsed them out into three categories. First were the legacy clients and the legacy clients were those older adults known to our congregate meals programs, the older adult mm -hmm. clubs. And they've been exceptional in reaching out to all of them and letting them know, welcome back, come back. And then we had that category that were the what we call the default home delivered meals clients. Um, and there were anywhere between 788 to 2000 in that category. Those have been uh, in most of those, about 800 of those have been incorporated into the home delivered meals program so that they can continue without, um, without, uh, without disruption. Um, thank God we were able to do that and the, and the providers had the capacity. And then the, in, in that there's this other 2000 category. And now as we get more data, we realize that there may be more. The case management agencies are continuing to assess mm -hmm. uh, clients who, fall, who have been identified as possibly needing long-term care and home delivered meals. They're assessing those so that we could appropriately discharge them to the to home home delivered meals. All right. Hence our conversation about <laughs> the increased amount of home <laughs> that's coming next. <laughs> and um, and then we have the recovery. So uh, and so so the as the law the short answer to to your question is like yes, we are doing assessments for those who may have identified that they have additional long term care needs and seeing which will be the appropriate program for them. Um, but I just always want to go back to those three buckets mm -hmm. so that people do not think that it's um, the entire 19,000 pool. Okay, I mean, with the, I mean, with the guest food program, we were able to capture a lot more uh, seniors, older adults that were not connected uh, to senior center, which is great. 
Uh, so we just want to make sure that we seize that opportunity to provide services to, to these Absolutely. older adults. Particularly and, if they mm -hmm. still, if they have beyond food insecurity that they have long-term care needs, mm -hmm. you know, so that's what we want to capture. The, and the, we have a, a good population receiving the meals regularly um, from recovery. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole idea of the community care plan, right? We want right. the, the older adults to be able to continue to age in the community that they love. And we want to make sure they get the services that they need. So previously, DIFTA talked about increasing the rate for home deliver meal to $10.52. Now, will we see the funding for the rate increase in the November plan, OMB's November plan, the 16.6 million? What I can tell you is that the administration is seriously looking at that, considering that, and it's very committed to that. Um, and, you know, we will all see, you know, there, there's so many needs out there. Um, but, but I can tell you in earnest um, that the city is seriously looking at those two issues. And you'll know that the priority is increasing meals, um, right? Um, and, you know, hopefully we can also increase food rate. But the goal mm -hmm. is to increase meals precisely because of the conversation we just had just a few seconds ago. Yeah. But we also want to make sure that the, the providers who are doing this work, you know, get um, the funding that they need. Maybe yeah. they're not We've short change. We've been in, in contact with all of the home, uh, home delivered meals providers. I mean, I talked to Ben Thomas directly about this, you know, um, and, and to the advocates. Um, this is a priority. This is a concern. It has not fallen on deaf ears. And uh, we want to continue the partnership and see how we can work towards a resolution. Yeah, and also during the Get Food program, they were able to, you know, improve the quality improve the diversity, the cultural sensitive meals, and they've gotten uh, providers to be able to do that and, and work with small businesses and the local community and the ethnic community. We wanna be able to continue some of those opportunities um, so that you know, during the pandemic, we're able to help them save jobs and we want that to continue. Uh, and there were, you know, there were some good things that came out of the program. In the beginning it was shaky, but you know, after all the advocacy and, and input. Yeah, and I and, think, and I, I'm very proud. We are, what, three weeks into the Get Food program. And I'm really proud of the uh, three providers that are doing the recovery meals. They are, you know, there are three providers and soon we'll probably be issuing a press release. Um, you know, we need to keep getting accurate data from Get Food so that they can mm -hmm. continue building their census. But I can tell you that we're very, very proud of the work that they did, they're doing, mostly because they are familiar with, with this. These are members of the aging network that are now directly involved in, uh, in the recovery meals. Right now, TIFTA currently received $4 million in funding for unmet need. What program areas, uh, such as case management, home care, uh, will benefit from this funding? What, $4 million? <laughs> In unmet needs? I'm not sure. I'm, which is the $4 million um, you're referring to, that every dollar that has been granted to Tifta is allocated. <laughs> It's allocated either to expansion of mental health mm -hmm. or expansion of, of, of recovery or the expansion of the NORC. So I'm not, you know, the senior centers of the older adult club. God, I can't even get it straight. Um, the older adult clubs. Uh, but I, I don't know of any of, of $4 million labeled unmet needs because we have a lot of needs. <laughs> Okay, I mean, we'll, well, we can try to clarify that. Yes, yeah, um, clarify chair. that. Yes. The, the, the funding um, is uh, supporting both case management and home care in addressing the wait list. Oh, okay. 
Oh, that, okay. That's not, un okay, that means unmet needs, got it. Yes. All right. Okay, all right. So we know that there's money in there. Um, and then also the controller's office shows there's a $35 million in contract in fiscal year 2022 for five borough-based home care providers. Uh, yeah. What is this plan to extend these contracts into fiscal year 2023 and beyond? Oh, um, is there going to be a new RFP? There will be a new RFP. Um, the RFP will be issued. Uh, what's the date, uh, Jocelyn? It was originally going to be issued this month, Chairwoman Chin. And our goal was to, um, you know, you basically have told me to delay RFPs so that people could start up programs. And we're doing just that. So Jocelyn, you want to talk about when the RFP is going to be issued? So we're going to be extending the contracts for one year and issuing the RFP for fiscal year 23. Okay. Fiscal year 23, so that'd be 24, uh, 22, 24. Okay. Yeah. So right. um, do you also support uh, the fair pay for home care campaign in Albany, which was raise wages to 150% of the regional minimum wage uh, is a budget uh, push right now in Albany with the state Senate bill 5374 and the Senate uh, and the assembly bill by Assemblyman Godfrey 6329 is to increase the, the wages for home care. What I can say to you is whatever will be the prevailing ways for home care workers, we will, we will support. We have to, I'm not sure exactly what position uh, the city has taken on that just yet, to be honest with you. Uh, but what I can tell you is all of those are along the lines of what we've always wanted to, what we've always been promoting, which is, and Jocelyn can talk more about this, is getting more people interested in the older adult part of human services, getting more professionals involved. And so to the extent that we can get wages that are comparable to uh, the, the worker, the services provided in another part of the sector, uh, it would be, it's important to, to the mm -hmm. aging community. You know that I've been talking for the longest time saying that I'm very concerned that the salaries in the aging network are low, lower than in some other networks. And so we're always looking at ways to equalize those as well as to professionalize the network, but also working with social work schools to encourage more and more people to go into the aging network. Yeah, it's definitely. It's a viable profession, but if it's not gonna have comparable salaries, that's one of the, that, you know, that's one of the drawbacks. Another, no, thing, another thing we've been doing, and we're building upon our existing work, um, as you know, the home care industry has been challenged with workforce, workforce shortages for a very long time um, for things like wages. And um, so, so, you know, DIFTA has a senior employment unit, mm -hmm. and we've been um, really ramping up our existing capacity around training older adults to become home attendants, as well as supporting job placement into the home care agencies in our network. Um, even though those challenges still exist, you know, we're seeing what capacity we can create through our own infrastructure to help support the, the needs of the clients. Yeah, I mean, right now, as, as I said early in my opening, you know, most of the home care workers are women and, uh, you know, people of color. And we need to sort of maybe help attract uh, a younger generation also to be interested yep. um, right. in right. working right. with older adults and in caregiving. Um, that's exactly. something we could really maybe work with DOE and, and with some of the high school that have career, yeah, career technical program to see this, you know, as a... Uh, it's a good occupation to be a caregiver. 
Um, so we should definitely continue to advocate on that. Uh, in terms of the two resolution um, that we are also addressing, uh, do you have um, do you have any uh, comments? You support you know creating a a task force to study the state of long term care uh, service in the New York City and also uh, the issue of uh, home care hour limiting the number of home care hour that a, a home health aide should work. Yeah, especially so, yeah. the the twenty four hour shift. Well, I want to go to the to the first one uh, first. Mm -hmm. Is of course we would because that would be aligned with our caregiving, our, our community care plan, which is to look at a task force because we would hope that that task force would look at increasing dollars and services at the local level and not, you know, institutional care is essential, but that we could have some parity in terms of increasing services locally so that people can age in place. So of course, um, we would want to have other voices on that task force that have that perspective and not just an, you know, a Medicaid institutional life mm -hmm. care kind of approach. So yes, mm -hmm. we would support that. And we hope that we're asked to be part of that task force. Um, as in terms of, you know, fair wages and, and, uh, and, and adequate work conditions and fair work conditions, the city has always been supportive of that. I'm sure they're studying that and looking at the implications. Um, but I know that the city has always been a, a, a fair labor uh, advocate. Well, I think we would also, you know, we're gonna push forward with these uh, resolution, but I hope that administration, uh, the mayor and yourself would also reach out to the, the state legislature and urge them uh, to pass these bills and the governor, you know, to sign so that we can, yeah. Get it implemented as quickly yeah, as we'll possible. We'll talk to our state yeah. ledge folks yeah. and mm -hmm. see what the strategy and the approach is. Absolutely. Yeah, that that would be appreciated. I mean, especially the one on the the limiting the number because we have you know heard complaints from home care worker about the twenty four hour shift. I mean, even though the law say, oh yeah, you could sleep for eight hours and you have three hour meal, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and only getting thirteen hour worth of pay. Uh, for the 24 hour work, it doesn't make sense. And we need to get that change. Um, so we welcome your support. Um, Committee Council, I, I don't think I have any more questions. Uh, so we will uh, continue to work together to make yep. sure we increase that budget and, and to get the, the home deliver meal increase money on the, in, the Octo in the November plan. So now we're in the middle of November. We hope to see that in there. And we just uh, really appreciate the partnership commissioner uh, with you. And we have one more hearing to go. And so we're gonna I know, I can't make sure we get, a, get as I, much I, done as we can. I know, I, 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 but before you go, or before you turn it over to, to our colleagues, the one thing that I want to say is that, and, and, and this goes to, uh, Council member Vallone, but Chairwoman Chin, you have been one of the strongest advocate. When I came to this agency um, over three years ago, no, just, just barely three years ago, I don't even think I've reached the third year. And, what, and 18 months of those have been pandemic. <laughs> I can say that regardless of that pandemic, you had your steadfast advocacy and your commitment to increasing the resources of this agency have been realized. And we are far, um, we are over 500 million. And when I started here, we were barely 400 million. So that is a tribute to you and your advocacy, obviously the mayor and I will, you know, the other partner in our crime and who's a steadfast <laughs> pass, pa partner is Mel, you know, or the, I'm sorry, deputy that mayor. mayor. Of she has been a steadfast partner. And so the things that we have been able to accomplish is because this, the three amigas, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and I wanna thank you from the, you know, just as a long-term advocate, um, this, is how, this is how government works. Yeah, I was you know? really happy that we had a, you know, 
Deputy Mayor Herzog when I heard that she was appointed. Uh, yeah, I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm labeling us the three amigas. <laughs> it's been amazing. <laughs> no, that, that's great. And of course, we, we do thank the mayor because every time he sees me coming, he knows what oh, I'm no, yeah. about to say. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and he, he'll always here. say, every, you turn every hearing into a budget hearing. <laughs> Yeah, but we also want to thank all the providers. You know, some of them yeah, will be testifying do. later. They're the one that keep us on our toes and make sure that we continue the advocacy on on the much yeah, needed. Yeah, but things. I also, you know, you know, you know, I'm gonna take the, the uh, poetic privilege here. But advocacy is important, and united and united advocacy. Adver adversary doesn't move us much. It's strong, united, focused advocacy that gets the results that you and the deputy mayor have been able to accomplish. So I thank you for that. No, yeah, and the, the advocates have been great. I mean, they have been supportive and worked together with us. So we really appreciate it. Yeah. So thank you, uh, commissioner. And, and thank you, Jocelyn, uh, assistant commissioner uh, for joining us today and answering all our questions. And if there's anything that we missed, we will let you know, but we really appreciate uh, all of you for being here and uh, have a wonderful, Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, before I, I'll see Thank you in you. December. But we'll talk. We're going to finally have a Thanksgiving with family. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we'll we'll do some offline follow up. You and I. Okay, great. We'll do. All that. right. Thank you again. So I pass it back to our committee council, Crystal. Okay. Thank you, Chair Chan and Commissioner. Uh, we will now begin public testimony. The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be James O'Neill. Brianna Payton Williams and Tara Klein. I'd like to remind everyone that I will be calling in individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant um, has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in, in the order that you raise your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. The panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer, then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I will now call on James O'Neill. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Chen and members of the Committee on Aging. My name is James O'Neill and I am an uh, executive council member of AARP New York, representing the 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. Thank you for providing AARP with the opportunity to testify at today's hearing to discuss the state of caregiving and home care in New York City and to provide our recommendations on how to help family caregivers and their loved ones at the city and state level. As an organization representing the 50 plus New, York, New Yorkers, AARP has conducted extensive research into both informal and formal caregiving in New York and across the country. In our research on this topic, we have identified a number of issues that have emerged in caregiving that our elected leaders need to address in order to improve the lives of older New Yorkers and their caregivers moving forward. According to a 2017 survey conducted by the New York City Department of Aging, there were between 900,000 and 1.3 million informal unpaid family caregivers in New York City who provide nearly 13 billion worth of unpaid care per year. The majority of the city's informal caregivers are women above the age of 50. And more than half of these unpaid family caregivers provide at least 30 hours of care to their loved ones each week. While individuals can find much meaning provided care to their loved ones, unpaid caregiving has become an increasingly significant source of financial strain for New Yorkers and other individuals across the country. In a research survey that AARP conducted in 2021, we found that about 80% of unpaid caregivers reported to have incurred routine out-of-pocket expenses to care for their loved ones and on average, those out-of-pocket expenses total over $7,000. We also discovered that an average unpaid family caregiver are spending about 26% of their total income on caregiving costs, and Latinos and African-American family caregivers face even greater financial strains on their incomes than other groups as they care for their loved ones. 
Unpaid family caregivers have also suffered from the added stress of balancing their work and caregiving responsibilities amid uh, months of pandemic. AARP recommends that the mayor and city council take the following steps to improve the state of caregiving in New York City. Introduce legislation in the city council that would explore the feasibility of developing a new common, uh, a new caregiver tax credit for residents providing direct care to a loved one to address the common financial strain caused by informal Time expired. Care. Please continue. Yeah. Two, increase city funding of expanded availability of in-house respite services to provide family caregivers with additional breaks, as well as to expand adult day care services with improved transportation options to and from such facilities citywide. Three, expand DIFTA's outreach efforts to caregivers with more multilingual and culturally competent materials to ensure that the city's network of caregivers are aware and have access to DIFTA's caregiving resources. Urge your colleagues in the New York State um, Legislature to pass a series of bills that would help to improve the lives of caregivers and older adults receiving care in New York City, which include enacting a statewide family caregiver tax credit as proposed in Senate Bill S620 uh, by May and Assembly Bill A6932 Kim to provide family caregivers with the financial resources needed to safely care for their aging loved ones in their homes. And B, passing and enacting Senate Bill S5988 and Assembly Bill A3922A that would establish a, a long-term care task force to examine the state of long-term care, both home and, and facility-based across New York State while also considering potential models of improvement. We're eager to see Council Member Chen introduce a resolution, resolution 1783-2021, calling on her colleagues at the state level to pass this legislation. We would urge the city, the rest of the city council to support this resolution and to call your colleagues in Albany to ensure that this legislation is passed in the next session. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, James. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Brianna Payton Williams, followed by Tara Klein, and then Jack, Jack Kupferman. Time Brianna? starts. Hello, I'm Brianna Payton Williams, the Communications and Policy Associate at Live on New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live on New York's members include more than 100 community based nonprofits that provide core services which allow all New Yorkers to thrive in our communities as we age. Today, we have the opportunity to discuss a key pillar in the continuum of care that enables thousands of older New Yorkers and people with disabilities to age in place, and that is home care. In many ways, home care, along with the entire continuum of community-based services, are the critical support to ensuring individuals can age in communities rather than in institutional settings. Unfortunately, like much of the network of services that support an individual's ability to age in place, our home care systems rely on a workforce that is both underappreciated and underpaid. Historically, even more so during the pandemic, the unmet need for home care for older New Yorkers and people living with disabilities was exacerbated by high turner, tur turnover excuse me, um, and staff shortages due to low wages. Further, COVID-19 disproportionately impacted older adults and individuals of color, re revealing existing inequities and the overburdened state of our long-term care system. Evidence of the inequitable and underappreciated nature of care work, which is predominantly provided by women in the BIPOC individuals, the median annual earning of New York's home care workers is only $22,000. In comparison to other industries, the home care industry will require significant resources and investments to ensure all workers receive a livable and competitive wage. And today we have the opportunity to address the challenges that arose during the pandemic and to provide improved and long lasting care services for older adults. And to in order to tackle these important issues, Live on New York recommends the following. 
One, full funding and an out-year plan to consistently eliminate home care and case management waiting list. The waiting list for home care and case management remains a chronic issue in New York City, with waiting lists for services existing for years despite modest investments. Two, the city should advocate to the state to pass and fund fair pay for home care. And the purpose of this leg legislation is to establish a base wage for home care workers at 150% of the regional wage and thereby ensuring that the role of home care workers remains competitive, at least in comparison to physicians funded at minimum wage. And third, a 48 million cost of living adjustment for essential human service workers, including those that execute the DIFTA caregiving, case management and home care programs. In addition, Live on New York strongly supports Council Member Chin's resolution in support of Senate Bill 598B, which seeks to create a task force to reimagine long-term care and the study and study the long-term or long-run impacts, excuse me, of long-term care services in New York State. And we join in echoing the resolution's call Time for expired. the governors to sign this important legislation into law. Live on New York has long advocated for the emergence of a task force to seize the opportunity to emphasize the cost-effective community-based long-term long -term care models that already exist and could be further expanded. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Tara Klein, followed by Jack Kupferman, and then Sahila Stevens. Tara? Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Chen, for hosting today's hearing. Uh, my name is Tara Klein, a senior policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses. UNH is a policy and social change organization representing 40 neighborhood settlement houses in New York City. Uh, my testimony focuses on the paid home care workforce and the economic crisis facing nonprofit home care providers due to state funding and policies that perpetuate near poverty wages. Three of our UNH member organizations provide home care services as state licensed home care services agencies. Every year, these settlement houses provide services to over 4,500 individuals with nearly 7,500 workers. While the home care industry is comprised of both for-profit and nonprofit home care agencies, these community-based organizations serve distinct roles, serving their neighborhoods with culturally competent care and offering many important wraparound services and programs beyond home care. With the demand for home care increasing and with the nursing home crisis in New York that escalated during the pandemic, it's clear that the home care model should be preserved and elevated. At the same time, home care is at a crisis point with a workforce shortage brewing that is expected to grow in the next several years. This shortage is in large part due to a systematically underpaid workforce comprised largely of women of color and immigrants. These poor wages are predominantly due to state policies, including low Medicaid and MLTC reimbursement rates, and the State Department of Labor's 13 hour rule of 13 hours of pay for a 24 hour work shift. Nonprofit home care providers are stymied by these policies, unable to pay the fair wages that they know their workers deserve due to a lack of funds. UNH has a number of policy recommendations to stabilize and strengthen the home care workforce while ensuring nonprofit providers are able to remain financially viable. First, we support the state's fair pay for home care bill, which would ensure workers are paid uniform and fair wages across the state at 150% of the regional minimum wage. Critically, the bill ensures that this higher pay is funded through Medicaid reimbursement rates and does not unfairly fall on providers. Uh, next, we support City Council Resolution 1784A in support of the Sledge Shifts Bill by Senator Persaud and Assemblymember Epstein. This bill seeks to rectify the unfair pay structures that result from the 13 hour rule by capping the number of shift hours at 12 hours in most cases. This would massively reduce if not eliminate the number of 24 hour shifts. We know that this bill is not feasible without a significant financial investment. A parallel effort to increase wages and mitigate the worker shortage that this bill would otherwise exacerbate and a clear mechanism to fully pay for the rare 24 hour cases that may occur. Uh, we know that the bill sponsors share our concerns and are working on strengthening the bill language right now. Um, and while the state plays the largest role, the city can play a role in alleviating the home care workforce shortage by focusing on recruitment, training, and making home care an attractive career. 
This can include building on existing workforce development and training programs, like one at HRA that worked with cash assistance recipients, and programs at CUNY and SBS. Uh, further, many home care agencies have employer-led training programs, which are not supported by government funding, and a city investment in these programs could help them expand their work. Uh, we have several other recommendations um, and more info is in my written testimony, and we're more than happy to follow up anytime. So thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Jack Kupferman, followed by Shahila Stevens and Wayne Ho. Time starts now. Thank you so much for giving me giving us the opportunity to participate. I'm Jack Kupferman, president of Great Panthers NYC, and we're honored to be able to provide a short testimony. It's indisputable that COVID-19 has opened every wound in society, especially in America's long-term care systems. It's indisputable that reform and systemic change for America's long-term care system is long overdue. Great Panthers NYC applauds the two resolutions calling on the governor to create an essential vehicle for change, reimagining Long-Term Care Task Force Act, and also support the limitations on home care aid work. The emphasis must always be on the long-term care recipient. They are the beneficiaries of legislative change, not just the facilities, not just the providers, not just the staff. We must always strengthen robust accountability, fully enforce existing statutes and regulations, ensure humane administration, and ensure proper provision of long-term care services. The human rights of every person receiving long-term care had not been considered a policy priority until the past year and a half. COVID-19 wreaks unimaginable waves of death among long-term care recipients. The pain of loss among those without adequate outlets is staggering. We urge you to ensure that these resolutions do not become mere window dressing. During the pandemic, windows to the outside world became portals to the incarceration of too many long-term care recipients. Honor their lives, honor their families, honor their memories by reimagining long-term care in New York State so they can thrive. Great Panthers Initiative Honoring Nursing Home Lives is committed to ensure that the rights of those in long-term care are protected and that their individual voices are the agent of change. And to that effect, we would encourage you to uh, watch our award-winning uh, documentary on just this topic. I just want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in today's session. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Shahila Stevens, followed by Wayne Ho. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Shahila Stevens, and I'm the Senior Director of Programs at Encore Community Services, a nonprofit serving older adults on the Manhattan West Side from 110th Street down to 14th Street. We offer a range of services to help older New Yorkers age successfully, including operating an older adult center in the theater district, providing home delivered meals running and running two senior housing buildings, one affordable housing and one supportive housing. Um, as we continue to expand our services, we are being called on more and more often to arrange for home health aid services, to navigate the long-term care system on behalf of our seniors, and also working with home health aid um, staff within our buildings who often are working in unsafe environments. They don't have the proper resources. And at times it seems like the overseeing bodies are not aware of these issues, including many of our home health aides not being paid on a regular schedule or also additionally being asked to work well past the limit of hours because of the vacancies and staffing. Um, through our work at Encore Community Services, we also run into extraordinary difficult with our older adults and their families as they try to secure home health services, where individuals who have significant needs have only six hours a week of home health care services. And they're often left alone 
for more than 15 hours at a time. Older New Yorkers have provided countless contributions to the city and their communities through their lives. And then when they are in need of care, they're often left to fend for themselves. Finances are a primary obstacle, though, obstacle, though as mentioned before, the shortage of quality care workers certainly contributes to the challenges. We see this issue impact every kind of New Yorker, except those who have significant wealth. We've seen middle-class individuals become vulnerable, bed-bound or homebound, and they struggle for home health care because they're barely over the cusp of income restrictions. They are on a fixed income and can't afford to pay out of pocket for these additional expenses, but, and they can't access the benefits that they need and seem to fall through those cracks, where they're having to debate on whether they should pay for additional hours or buy groceries. But we also struggle to get services for older New Yorkers who have already been identified by the system as the most vulnerable. Our city funded supportive housing building, which is supposed to be permanent supportive housing for older New Yorkers, do not provide funding to the programs to arrange for the appropriate home care services on site. And oftentimes as an organization, we are um, either paying out of pocket for these additional services for our seniors or having to navigate this very difficult Time system. expired. We are able to provide many services ourselves, but not this particular um, care option as it requires a skilled worker. We are um, very focused on making sure that the care needs and medical needs and the safety and security of our seniors are addressed. We'd like to hire a nurse to provide services um, for this care, but the terms of our city contract do not allow us the funds for that expense. And it, is seen, it, it seems that they consider that um, an extra support, but not a necessary support. At Encore, we do not believe that accessing home care to live out your life with as much health and dignity as possible is optional for our residents or any New Yorker. We urge the city to consider how it can improve access to home care services for aging residents. The issues only become more urgent as our city demographic continues to shift. Over the past 10 years, the number of older adults in the city has skyrocketed and they're important. The 65 plus population increased 12 times faster than the city's population for under 65 years old. And now they represent more than 1.24 million people across the five boroughs. It is critical that the city work to better address the home care and caregiving needs of older um, New Yorkers in the city. And Encore wholeheartedly supports equal pay and improved pay for home health aid and caregiving agencies. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Shahila, and I'm sorry for butchering your name previously. Oh, that's okay, it's a unique <laughs> name. <laughs> Uh, I will now call on Wayne Ho. Time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wayne Ho, and I'm the president and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council. I want to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today, as well as Council Member Chin, who has been a staunch advocate for 12 years in her time in office for older adults and immigrants and others. Uh, CPC is the largest Asian American social services nonprofit in the country, and amongst our services includes providing a wide range of culturally competent and linguistically accessible programs to seniors. We serve over 11,000 seniors per year, including 3,000 seniors through our subsidiary, the CPC Home Attendant Program, which was licensed in 1998. I am here today to speak in support of the resolutions to call on the state Senate and the governor to reimagine to create a task force to reimagine long term care, as well as the resolution for the state legislature and the governor to sign uh, a 3145, which would mandate split shifts for our home care workers with 24 hour shifts. Um, For years, uh, CPCHAP has been advocating 
for the state of New York to invest additional Medicaid funding to support our home care workers and ensure better services. We are a 100% Medicaid funded home care agency with contracts with the New York City Human Resources Administration, as well as health insurance companies. Um, because we have to follow all of these regulations, one of the main issues that affects us is 24-hour cases and specifically the 13-hour rule, uh, where we're only allowed to compensate workers for 13 hours of care uh, during a 24-hour live-in shift. Uh, we have been in support of the workers who have been calling for changes to this and mandating 12-hour split shifts, which is a reason why we stand behind the resolution that's been introduced. Um, while we actively try to avoid taking 24-hour cases, our contracts with HRA and with managed care organizations mandates that we do that. We have to comply with the patient's bill of rights, which mandates 24-hour care. And ultimately, um, all of these efforts will not be supported unless we can get state intervention to better support our consumers and ensure that there's better compensation for our workers. Um, while we have been for years advocating for the Epstein and Perso bill, as well as fair pay for home care, we are delighted that the city council and the city is going to try and do more to join us in these advocacy efforts. Um, we need to adjust the Medicaid rates. We need to make sure that if the legislation is passed, it does not become an unfunded mandate. Time expired. We also need to make sure that our efforts are supplemented um, with fair pay for home care, which uh, others who've testified today have said that even if we have split shifts due to worker shortages, we do not want to see more consumers go into long-term care facilities. We want them to age in place in their home safely. So in addition to creating a long-term care task force, passing the bill to mandate split shifts uh, for 24-hour cases, we also support fair pay for home care. Um, Ultimately, while CPC HAP has been a high road employer and compensating our workers for overtime, for interruptions, for transportation, um, we also recognize that there must be systemic change. And that's why we are grateful for the support of Council Member Chin, the Aging Committee, and the City Council to pass this resolution because it's not just about CPC addressing our own 24 hour cases. This is a systemic issue and we need to make sure that we get to the core. So we need to see the state intervention and we thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you again to council member Chin for her longtime leadership, not only on aging issues, but also all issues affecting vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Wayne. At this time, if your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, Chair Chin, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank this uh, panel, uh, all the people who came. Uh, to testify today and thank you for your service uh, to our older adults. And we will definitely, you know, join in um, to advocate with the state because they have to intervene and really help us uh, solve this issue of, you know, fair pay for our home care workers and support services for our caregivers. Um, this is long overdue. Uh, I remember even working with uh, the home care at Union 1199, we were demonstrating with workers trying to get an increase in pay. And I think the workers still are not even getting uh, the state minimum wage, and that is not right. So we have to really continue uh, our advocacy. And I really wanna thank uh, all the providers, um, UNH, for your Tara, for your long-term advocacy and Live on New York. And, and all the service providers, CPC, Encore. I know the executive director was at our last hearing also. Um, we just have to continue to advocate uh, for more funding for our older adult population. And the uh, commissioner spoke earlier that we have made some, you know, big strive in the last eight years uh, in terms of increasing the budget. And we will hope that the next administration will continue uh, to see older adults as an important population 
uh, in the city. Our number is growing. So we just need to amplify our voice and make sure that the services are there for us. So thank you again for uh, coming to testify today. And uh, I will call this meeting um, to its conclusion. So thank you to all the sergeants. Uh, thank you to committee, uh, committee council uh, and all the staff for helping uh, with this hearing today.